If you're a regular at City Church and have been walking with us through the Gospel of Mark, uh, you may feel a little bit of deja vu this morning as we read the text. This is the second recorded feeding of a multitude in Mark's Gospel. Uh, we find some similarities to the first feeding uh, of the crowd. They're in a remote place, a wilderness, a desert. Uh, they're in this, there's this like large, um, hungry, borderline, angry, hangry crowd that has been with Jesus now for three days. They're a long way from home. Jesus has compassion upon them, and he responds with this idea of feeding them, same as in the last story. Uh, the disciples' response is similar. The disciples are like, how are we ever going to feed this large crowd? Uh, both stories have these kind of meager resources available, um, a few biscuits and a few, I don't know, catfish fillets or something uh, to feed this multitude of people. Same idea, Jesus gives thanks, he breaks the bread, he distributes the bread and the fish and it just goes on and on and on. The crowd eats and is satisfied, they have plenty of leftovers and then Jesus sends the crowd away, gets in a boat and heads to the other side of the lake. And so that's some of the similarities in the stories. Uh, there's enough similarities that some scholars have thought maybe it's the same story uh, being told on repeat. But uh, there's a lot of differences in the story too. And we'll kind of highlight some of those as we uh, walk through the text together. So let's note some of these um, differences back in verse 1. Um, in those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, um, he called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way, and some of them will have come afar from afar. And so some of the differences here, uh, Jesus is in Gentile territory now, not Jewish territory. Uh, we saw last week, the last two weeks, Jesus has been hanging out in Gentile territory. He's in this area known as the Decapolis, which means ten cities, ten Gentile city, so he's in this Gentile region, which reminds us again, the gospel of the kingdom is for all people. It is for Jews, it is for Gentiles, rich and poor. It's not an exclusive message for an exclusive group. The gospel is being proclaimed in Gentile territory. Notice in this text, Jesus says, I have compassion, right? In the previous instance, it was the, the narrator who was kind of saying Jesus had compassion on here. We see a first-hand account here, Jesus saying, I have compassion. I've mentioned when this word compassion comes up in the text, um, it has to do with a kind of gut-wrenching emotion. It's deep-seated. It's something that comes from um, on the inside, a gut-wrenching emotion. So Jesus has this gut-wrenching emotion uh, for this hungry crowd. This crowd in Mark 8 has been with Jesus for three days. The previous crowd had been with him for one day. And this word with means that they have been remaining, like intentionally choosing to stay with Jesus. There's an intentionality that they want to be with Jesus. Um, we, we saw in the opening chapters of Mark's gospel that kind of the defining mark of a, of a disciple is that they want to be with Jesus. Same language here. They want to be with Jesus. And so we see this great multitude for three days chooses to stay with Jesus, to remain with Jesus, to learn from Jesus. Um, in this text, Jesus perceives the problem. He's like, look, they're a long way from home. They're hungry, and I'm not sure they're even going to make it back without fainting. In the previous incident, it was the disciples who kind of took notice. Either way, here, Jesus takes notice of their needs. And I've said week after week, he's the type of Savior who knows what you need, who seeks out um, your, your needs and your wants and your hurts. He takes notice of needs. I feel like in this text, Jesus is kind of extending the disciples the second chance to redeem themselves, right? I mean, the first incident, the disciples totally blew it. They're like, how are we ever going to feed this crowd? You're out of your mind. We don't have enough money. And so it's almost like Jesus is on repeat to say, like, here's your opportunity, guys, right? The first time we know what happened, here's an opportunity to redeem yourselves. And we see what happens in verse 4. They don't quite get it. His disciples answered him, how can one feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? The disciples are still not tracking. Now, if you read this with me, like I read it, it's just a couple of chapters removed from the previous incident. 
And so you kind of scratch your head and think, how are the disciples not getting it, right? Now, think in terms of Mark writes his gospel in a very compact, urgent way. Things move quick and happen quick. This could have been months, if not year, in between incidents, okay? So it's not like just, why don't they just flip back a couple of chapters and realize what happened, right? This is an ongoing story. And so the disciples just don't get it. And we'll see kind of as we bring this whole message full circle that we're not much different than the disciples when it comes to things like this of just not really grasping what Jesus has to say. And so then the miracle happens beginning in verse 5. He asked them, how many loaves do you have? They said seven. <clears throat> he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground, took the seven loaves, having given thanks, he broke them, gave them to his disciples to set before the people. They set them before the crowd. They had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said to these also should be set before them. So in this instant, we have seven loaves and a few fish. The word translated fish here is a little different than the previous incident. Most believe that the word fish here is the idea of kind of like a sardine. All right, let's have an honesty moment. How many of you like open up the old school can, stink up the house, sardines? Wow. How many of you like Vienna sausages? Wow, same group, same group. Or as my dad calls them, what do you call them? Vini. V it's not Vienna sausages, it's, v I don't know, Vienna, there we go. Vienna sausages. That's a city, you know, in Europe that's Vienna. You wonder, do you think they serve Vienna sausages in Vienna? It seems kind of out of place. All right, let's just go full circle here. Potted meat. I mean, just go ahead and keep your hand up at this point. The same people just Spam. Spam's a delicacy in Hawaii. Ash and I were in Hawaii a few years ago for a trip and serving Spam with the breakfast. There we go. San Antonio is a delicacy, spoken from a Texas man. All right, so what was I talking about? Sardines. Seven loaves and a few fish. In the first incident, it was five pieces of bread and two fish. Again, Jesus seats the crowd. He gives thanks. Interesting word here, the word thanks. Um, in the original language, is the word uh, Eucharistin, which is where we get the word Eucharist, okay? Uh, Eucharist, obviously, another word for the Lord's Supper. Jesus breaks the bread. He distributes these gifts of grace um, to the people. And once again, the clueless disciples are invited in as kind of these inadvertent servants, these dispensers of grace. They have the opportunity to serve the people and display God's goodness and kindness, even though they are not tracking with what's going on, that Jesus continues to bring the disciples in uh, to be dispensers of his grace and goodness to uh, the people. Uh, verse 8, and they ate again and were satisfied, and they took up the broken pieces, left over seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. Uh, this time there's about 4,000, the word people here is a generic word, meaning probably men, women, boys, and girls. Um, I'll let you go back and listen to the previous message if you missed it about the feeding of the multitude before. Now, there's strong indicators in the previous text that the 5,000 who were gathered before potentially were revolutionaries. There was a word that was used predominantly of men. They were in the desert and they were looking for a king to set up an earthly kingdom and overthrow the Romans. Um, this is not the case here. This is 4,000 men, women, boys, girls. Remember, they're in Gentile territory. So different audience, but same miracle. And the word satisfied here, the people ate and were satisfied. It's actually the same word back in verse 4 that the English translators chose to translate feed. How can one feed these people? Same words translated satisfied down the road. So the idea is that only Jesus brings satisfaction. That it's only Jesus who can satisfy this, this hungry crowd. It's only Jesus who can satisfy our spiritually hungry souls. And then Jesus sends them away. This idea of send away is to release, to liberate someone. And so he satisfies their hungry souls and he sets them free. He liberates them. And so what a beautiful picture again. Even though it's kind of full circle, a lot of the same details, there's some differences. And we see the compassion of Jesus. We see these same things bleed through. 
of a, a Savior who meets people where they are, who establishes their needs, who meets their needs, who leaves them satisfied and liberated um, from the hunger of their souls. And then verse 10, again, same thing happens immediately. There's our trigger word in Mark. Immediately he got into the boat with his disciples and went to the district of Dalmanutha. This is uh, on the western shore of Galilee. And then as happens again and again, verse 11, the Pharisees came and began to argue with him, uh, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test or to tempt him. So Jesus gets in the boat. He's he immediately accosted by the Pharisees who tempt Jesus. This word tempt is only used of two groups in Mark's gospel. It's used of the Pharisees who test or tempt Jesus. I think it's used three or four times of them. And the only other person in the gospel it's used of is Satan. That Satan tests Jesus. He tempted Jesus. So same word is used of Satan tempting Jesus and the Pharisees testing Jesus. So the, the, the attempt here by the Pharisees is to get Jesus to validate who he is through some sort of sign from heaven. Now, don't think in terms primarily of miracle here, right? They've watched miracles. Uh, they're aware of the miracles that have taken place. Think more in terms of they're looking for God the Father to show some type of physical, physical earthly affirmation of who Jesus is. They're looking for a sign from God that Jesus is who he claims to be, right? It's not like they're looking... I mean, Jesus has performed miracles, not like they don't have anything to draw from. He just got through feeding a massive crowd. They've watched him heal sick people, right? And the blind and the lame and all the things that we've watched unfold to exercise demons. And so it's less about, hey, perform a miracle and more about like, hey, we want God to prove that you are. As a matter of fact, the word that's used here is the idea they want to gain control of Jesus. They want, important, they want Jesus to be who they want Him to be. They want Jesus to seek their approval. They want a different sort of Messiah. They want a different type of king than who Jesus is. They want a power-oriented, power-focused king who wins over followers and garners support with these kind of supernatural displays and these feats of strength, right? These putting together kind of an army or a group of revolutionaries. The Pharisees are not wanting to believe in Jesus if Jesus can put on some type of impressive display. They're attempting to divert Jesus from his cross-focused, cross-centered mission, which launched this cross-shaped kingdom. They don't want the type of kingdom that Jesus is inaugurating. They do not want the type of king that Jesus claims to be. A king that is headed toward a sacrifice, headed toward death, headed toward persecution and suffering. That's not the type of king they're looking for. They want a king who's going to rally the troops, establish an earthly kingdom, and put them in charge, right? That's the type of king they want. They want Jesus to be who they want him to be, not who Jesus is. They are not interested in the type of Jesus that Jesus is. And now we're going to circle back to this because it's just so how we tend to live life. We're all in with Jesus as long as he, his agenda kind of lines up with mine. But if Jesus asks me to step outside of my agenda, my plan, my philosophy, my purpose, my preferences, not quite the type of Jesus that we want. And so we kind of, again, in the text, see ourselves kind of lining up with the Pharisees again and again. As we're invited into the text, we line up a lot more with the Pharisees and the kind of scratching their head disciples than we do with Jesus, right? So verse 12, look how Jesus responds. We saw this word last week. He sighed deeply in his spirit. And he said, why does this generation seek a sign? Truly I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, he got into the boat again, and went to the other side. And so Jesus responds with this deep sigh. Uh, we saw this word last week at the end of chapter 7 uh, when Jesus looks at 
um, the man that was, that was deaf and had the speech impediment, remember? And he sighs deeply, which I said was kind of this idea of compassion. And it's the idea of groaning. And the reason that he is groaning is because God's kingdom, while it's been inaugurated, there's still brokenness in the world. It's the same idea that Paul uses in, in Romans when we did the Romans series in chapter 8, when Paul says that all of creation is groaning for the restoration, when Paul says that we as followers of Jesus are groaning for the final day. And so the, the same word here. And it's interesting that Jesus is groaning over the religious. He's groaning over the Pharisees. And so even in this moment, Jesus is expressing like deep grief over the unbelief of the Pharisees. And he's longing for that day when all of creation will be made whole in him. And so there's this groaning, there's this compassion that Jesus has even for the religious leaders. And then he uses, he borrows this language um, from the Exodus event where he references this generation, okay? Now, let me be clear here. It's, Jesus is not like the cranky dude like me now. That's like, and I'm, you know, I've hit 50 and uh, I'll just put myself in the category with some of you that are older than me. And we're all, all constantly moaning about this generation, right? Um, this generation doesn't understand this. Just, this generation doesn't know how to work, right? This generation only wants these things. My kids love it when I use that type of language. My older kids who are in their 20s. Anytime I'm talking about this generation, right, they just say, all right, you're right, Dad. There's no rolling of the eyes. There's no, like, here we go again, right? Um, so I, 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 we're not putting Jesus in this category where he's just bemoaning this generation, uh, Jesus is using this generation language because it takes us back to Exodus, the language of the Exodus. Which is, so it's this flashback to these grumbling, complaining Israelites who wandered around the desert for 40 years and they were constantly second-guessing God. Can God do this? Can God do these things? Can God supply? Like, let's make a golden calf, right? So that's the reference back to the Exodus event. It is a people who are marked not by faith and trust, but a people who are marked by rebellion and unbelief. See, the Pharisees are not asking for a sign from a posture of faith or a posture even of sincere doubt. They are asking from a place of obstinate unbelief. They've witnessed miracles firsthand. And yet they still try and force Jesus to be who they desire Him to be, to fit their agenda. And Jesus will have no part of it. Instead, He parts ways with the Pharisees, physically and symbolically here. He gets in the boat and washes His hands. I've had enough of this, right? Gets in the boat and returns to the other side of the lake. His cross-focused mission will not be Hindered. He will not acquiesce to who they desire Him to be. Just like He doesn't adjust to who we desire Him to be. He is who He is, right? It's our call to adjust to who He is, not vice versa. And so then this conversation happens in the boat between Jesus and the followers. Uh, verse 14, Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat, which I find kind of amusing in light of what just happened. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. So Mark takes our attention back to this interaction between Jesus and his disciples. They're in the boat, and they discover they have only one loaf of bread. Remember how many baskets of leftovers there were? Let's just pause here for a minute. A miracle just happened. Is there seven baskets? Is that what we read? Seven full baskets of bread left over? Like, who was the disciple responsible for getting enough bread out of the seven? Now, maybe they did something with the leftovers. Maybe they fed another group of people. Maybe they left them for others that were hungry. I don't know. But in my mind, I'm thinking, like, there had to be a disciple or two in charge of bread. You have seven baskets left over. And now, or, or maybe there was just one disciple that was, I don't know, enjoyed bread. We'll put it nicely, enjoyed bread a little more. Then the other, maybe he's the guy over there in the seven baskets just hammering the bread, right? And he just left one loaf. But here we are in the boat with only one loaf of bread left. It's like such a head-scratching moment for me. How do you only have one loaf left after there were seven baskets full 
of leftovers. And that's what they're focused on, right? The one loaf of bread. And so this conversation about bread ensues, but it becomes apparent quickly that Jesus and the disciples are not on the same page in this discussion. They're talking about a loaf of bread. Jesus is talking about something entirely different. And at this point in the narrative, it should not be a surprise to us that Jesus and the disciples are on two different pages in their conversation. So the disciples are moaning over the shortage of bread, and Jesus is warning about the yeast or the leaven of the Pharisees and Herod. When Matthew records this story, story, he identifies the leaven as the teaching of the Pharisees. Uh, Luke makes a reference in his gospel that this has to do with hypocrisy. Mark kind of just leaves us with this double warning. Watch out. Beware. So anytime there's this double warning in the text, it's like, wave your hands, red flashing light, be cautious, beware. Some of you here a few weeks ago when I told the story about us being at Orange Beach this summer and we were out in the water, I don't know how far we were, seemed like 50 yards, and suddenly we saw people waving their arms on the shore, a group of people, not just one random person that was stretching, I'm talking like, I don't know, 150 people? No, 10 people waving their arms frantically, using language you love to hear when you're in the water. Shark, shark, shark bait, ooh, ah, ah. (laughs) Finding Nemo reference, I have kids. Shark in the water, shark in the water. We were getting the two-arm wave, like danger, warning, beware, And then, by the way, we got home and saw on Facebook this picture someone posted from Orange Beach Gulf Shores area where there was not just one shark hanging out in the water. It seemed like there were hundreds of sharks hanging out just out of of eyesight. So just remember that next time you're hanging out in the ocean. Just write what's beyond you. As long as it stays there, I'm cool. Uh, But So warning, right? Double warning, to which I told you my two girls that were out in the ocean with us, they just walked on water back to the beach and just left Levi and out out in the ocean to fend for ourselves. While I'm trying to calm his beating little heart, like, don't worry about it, buddy, it's fine. It's just a shark, don't worry about it. Sharks are friends, not food. So, double warning, beware. Beware, there's danger. So Jesus is saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Now let me just impart some of my bread knowledge to you. I have bread knowledge, um, this much of it, because my wife likes to make homemade bread. And so I have a little bit of bread knowledge. And and if I'm being honest with you, I asked her last night, I wanted to get some more bread knowledge because I knew I was talking about leaven and yeast. And so... I asked her more about the leaven and yeast part of the process in bread making. And after about seven seconds, I was out. I zoned out. So I don't really know what happened. There was things involving temperature and turning the oven on and having it in a certain place. I know at some point it usually ends up outside or in front of a window. And I mean, there's language that's used about rising, not rising, good loaf, bad loaf. My, My bottom line when it comes to the bread making um, around our house is just, does it taste good, right? That's I don't care if it's dense, big, high, low, small. Does it taste good? And can you put honey on it? And these are my questions. But from what I understand, with my limited amount of bread knowledge, is that yeast is a leaven that ferments and causes bread to rise. So the idea is a small amount of fermented dough is inserted into a larger portion and eventually it pervades the whole loaf which is what makes it rise while it is baking now you have the same limited bread knowledge i have okay this metaphor in scripture is the idea that something starts small but eventually it permeates something bigger something larger most often in the text is the idea of corruption or evil intentions of the human heart which overtake our souls, unbelief that grows in our hearts. The reference here is to the Pharisees and Herod, which have nothing in common with each other except for one thing. 
their unified opposition to Jesus. Their refusal to believe in Him. Both Herod and the Pharisees, who were not together politically or religiously either one, both of them have one thing in common. They're both anti-Jesus. They refuse to believe in Him. So notice what Jesus is doing here. He's warning His own disciples against this same heart posture, one that grows into unbelief. And once again, the disciples are just clueless to what He's talking about. I mean, look at verse 16. And they began discussing one another the fact they had no bread. What? Again, they're talking about the loaf of bread. They're right back to blame game. You forgot the bread. We had seven baskets full left over. How can you not remember to bring more than one loaf of bread? Well, I thought everybody was getting their own loaf. That's why I've got this one. Right? That's what they're discussing. They're focused on bread and do not even realize they're being infected by leaven, by unbelief. So Jesus presses in and he asks these Seven rhetorical questions, verse 17. Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? And then look at these three questions in verse 18. We're going to zero in on them in just a moment. Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember? So three pivotal questions. Eyes to see, ears to hear, do you not remember? And then he circles back. Verse 19, when I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said 12. The seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? So Jesus presses in with these questions that expose their unbelief. Do you not see? Do you still not understand? Are your hearts hardened? Are you unable to see? Are you unable to hear? Do you not remember? Do you still not understand? Remember the two feedings, five loaves, 5,000 people, 12 baskets left over, seven loaves, 4,000 people, seven baskets left over. Why are you worried about bread? Are you failing to comprehend what is going on? Are you failing to understand, Jesus is saying, who I am? Here's the question Jesus is really asking them. Are you inside the kingdom or are you outside the kingdom? Are you one of mine? You're so focused. This is such a good word for each of us. You're so focused on what is right in front of you that you're failing to grasp who is right in front of you. You're so focused on the what that you can't see the who. You are fixated on a loaf of bread and failing to trust the bread of life. And Jesus is warning His disciples, His followers, you are no different than the Pharisees. You're looking for signs while the Messiah, the Son of God, stands right in front of you and you can't even see Him. And I believe that we're prone to fall into the same trap trying to make Jesus who we want Him to be to fit my agenda, or so focused on a loaf of bread instead of the bread of life. And Jesus asked us this morning the same question. Do you, do you not understand? So let's circle back just to those three questions and then we'll end. Because these questions help expose the leaven of our own hearts. That first question was, am I seeing? Am I seeing? Do I have eyes to see? Am I searching for signs of affirmation when God is working right in front of me? Now let me try to give you something really practical here. Because most of the time, I feel like we're looking for big affirming signs. Like if God would just speak from heaven, right? That'd be all good. Or I'm driving down the road, and if I'm supposed to do this, then the next word I'm going to see is no. And if I'm next word I see is yes, then I know I'm supposed to. Like that's how we tend to like 
God do some kind of affirming sign? And the question for us is, like, do you not see God like right in front of you in the everyday rhythms of life? Like, what did Jesus feed them with? He fed them with bread and fish. Bread and fish. This, these are things that the people in both Gentile and Jewish territory, they would, have, they would have eaten bread and fish every day. Their everyday pattern was bread and fish. Their everyday rhythm was bread and fish. And Jesus used the everyday. He used the ordinary to feed a multitude. Am I seeing the fingerprints of God in my everyday life? Because the fingerprints of God are everywhere in my everyday life. So I have this little bit of rhythm that I try to maintain in the morning that involves when I get up, do certain things, and actually I try to work out, and then part of my rhythm is I'll take Toby out for just a quick walk around our neighborhood. Okay, So it's not a huge neighborhood, and it's a fairly short 10, 15-minute walk. But I want my rhythm to be, particularly if it's just Toby and I and Ash doesn't come along, um, I want my rhythm to be in that moment. What I've began to pray is, God, give me eyes to see in this moment. And so what that means is it's just not the simple things of life. It's, wow, the sun came up today. <laughs> look at the sun. And this course this week has been like, look at the sun. But the sun, like if there's clouds in the sky, like to allow my mind to think, how does that even happen? Like look at the clouds. Like give me eyes to see that God created every blade of grass along this road that I'm walking, that every blade of grass has been created by God, that every pebble on the road, that every squirrel that runs by, that all of God's creation is singing and speaking of he, who He is, that all of creation are simple glimpses of the bigness of God. Now, here's how that has to happen in our lives in order for us to be able to see. Because let's be frank with each other. Life is busy. It's complicated. We're running a thousand directions all the time. And because life is so busy, if I am not intentional to stop and see, I will not see. I will not have eyes to see the bigness of God. Unless it just those moments where it just punches you in the face like, wow, God's big. But what I'm talking about is in the everyday rhythms of life, am I being intentional to see, to stop and see? Do I have eyes to see the fingerprints of God all around me? In my children, in our relationship, in our home, in the food that we have been graced with? I mean, am I being intentional to just stop and see where God is. So this, this past, um, it's in the past week or so, um, there was, I guess NASA or whoever's in charge of space, but NASA, they released again from the, uh, J I guess God's ultimately in charge of space, but you know where I'm going here. <laughs> so the James Webb Space Telescope, right? You've seen this in the news, sent back these images of galaxies, that are far, far away. Don't go there, Star Wars people. Sent back these images, and the image that came back is this galaxy that they are calling the, the Phantom Galaxy. So wrap your mind around this. The Phantom Galaxy is 32 million light years away. You're not going to get there in your lifetime. It's a long way away. Like even the images coming back, right? The images have outlived all of us by the time they get back. 32 million light years away. And they think just in this phantom galaxy that there are 100 billion stars. That's a big number. 100 billion stars. And every time this information comes out now, which it seems like with technology every year, every two years, they've gone further and deeper and bigger and more expansive. And the conversation is always, it is much bigger than we ever even began to imagine. 
Ash and I heard a, a comedian a couple of weeks ago was like, don't you think one time that NASA would come back and just say, you know what, the universe is not quite as big as we thought. It's actually a little smaller than we thought. He had like this whole bit about that. But that's not, right? That's not what happens. They come back and say it's bigger than we ever imagined. It's more expansive than we ever thought. That's the bigness of the God we serve. That's how big and vast He is, right? And so are we seeing that? Are we seeing how big God is? Or are we worried about loaves of bread? And what that means is, am I focused on what is right in front of me? Or am I seeing a God who holds the galaxies by His spoken word? My loaf of bread doesn't seem so difficult and big and complicated when I realize The God who's in control spoke those galaxies into place. What am I seeing? I'm so afraid that our eyes are focused on the junk food that's right in front of us, the loaves of bread, that we can't see the bread of life. And we can't stay focused on Jesus because we're so worried about the loaf of bread in my hand. The life problem, the job, the complexity, the... Whatever it is I've got going on in life, but my, my eyes are only focused on the what that I can't even see the who. God, give us eyes to see. How about the second question? Am I hearing? Do I have ears to hear? So here's a question in light of this question. And that question is, to what voices am I listening? You're, you're listening to something. You're listening to some type of voices. You're listening to external voices. You're listening to news and social media and gossip and opinions. And To what external voices am I listening? And then here's a bigger struggle for many of us based on our life journey. What internal voices am I listening to? The internal voices of, of guilt and shame and bitterness and unforgiveness and I'm, I'm not good enough and I don't measure up and what about this or what about that? Like sometimes the internal voices are more deafening to our spiritual ears than the external voices. Are you with me? Am I hearing? Do I have ears to hear? Let's be honest again. Life is noisy. It's noisy. There's lots of external voices to listen to, lots of internal voices weighing on our souls. So I have to stop and I have to, ready, be quiet and listen. Stop, be quiet, listen. Which again requires intentionality. Am I being intentional? Stop, be quiet, and listen. You know what that means? You've got to put your phone down sometimes. You've got to leave it where you can't hear it, where you can't see it, where you can't worry about if someone's texting you or who posted what junk on Facebook. You've got to get away from the noise to stop. And listen, and if you do not have in your every day, I said every day rhythm, moments of being away from your phone, you're not being intentional and you're listening. And you're not going to hear things God has to say because you're so focused on a six inch screen, a loaf of bread. For some of you, you're like, again, my phone's. A brick weighs 900 pounds. You have to flip that sucker open. I don't worry about all that phone stuff, right? So maybe it's not the phone for you. Maybe there's something in your life, though, that is creating noise. You have to be intentional. You have to be intentional to to turn off, right, to turn off Fox News for a while or CNN or whatever your vice of choice is when it comes to that. You have to be intentional to turn stuff off, turn down the noise to be able to hear, to be able to listen. Am I listening and what's so sad for most of us in the everyday rhythms of life is God has spoken and we hold it in our hands or it sits on our shelf or it's on our 
devices, right? It's even there on our devices that tend to distract us. There's options with our devices to be able to get God's voice in us, get God's Word in us, to be able to open it up and simply reflect and read and listen to what God has to say. To stop and listen. Do I have eyes to hear or am I allowing the noise to overwhelm my soul? Give us eyes to hear, or give us ears to hear, eyes to see. And then that last question, am I remembering? Am I remembering? You see, one of the primary ways to see, and one of the primary ways to hear, is to remember. To remember who God is. To remember what God has done. To remember what God is doing. Am I remembering how He is faithful? Remembering His faithfulness enables me to trust in the now and for the future. It gives me a lens by which to live life. If I can remember His faithfulness, then my problems don't seem so big. If I can remember His faithfulness, then my financial issues don't seem so large. If I can remember His faithfulness, then that person that drives me nuts at work doesn't seem so complicated because He's faithful. He's constant. And I have to constantly reflect upon who He is, upon who I am, so that my now and my future doesn't overwhelm my soul. Because that's where the leaven rests. That's where the leaven lies. As it plants itself in our soul and soon overtakes us. And the end result of it is not believing. Trusting myself as opposed to the God who hung the galaxies with a spoken word. Am I remembering? If you're like me, I tend to live life focused on the single loaf. And the bread of life invites me to partake in Him. To eat and be satisfied. To find fulfillment in His nourishment. Reminding myself every single day, He is enough for me today. He's enough for me today. And He'll be enough for me tomorrow. And He'll be enough for me next week. And He'll be enough for me next month. But right now, I don't know what tomorrow holds. I don't know what next week holds. I don't know what next month holds. But what I know is today, today, He's enough for me. I may have failed him miserably yesterday. I didn't listen right. My eyes were all over the place, focused on the single loaf. I didn't think one time about the bigness of God. Right? But that was yesterday. Today, his mercies are new. His mercies are fresh. And I'm going to recall and remember again today who God is. How faithful he is. And I'm going to seek to rest in that. Because I know tomorrow, Jesus said this, Tomorrow's going to bring its own set of problems. And I'm going to have to remind myself again tomorrow. He's faithful for today. That's why we use this language around City Church. It's not just cliche. It's like you preach the gospel to yourself. You remind yourself every day who you are in Christ. Remembering His faithfulness. So one of the practical ways that we do this as a church comes from this language that Jesus uses here in Mark, which fast forwards to the Lord's Supper, this, this idea of Eucharist or giving thanks. And there's this pattern that happens in the Lord's Supper, in the life of Jesus, and then in, when he commissions the followers of Jesus to partake in the Lord's Supper, there's this pattern of giving thanks and breaking bread and distributing the bread and then eating, right? Participating, celebrating who God is. Uh, we discussed this pattern back in the first feeding in chapter 6, and I kind of summarized it by this idea of we bless, we break, we give. Uh, That we bless, break, and give. That's what the Eucharist is all about. It is this redemptive pattern of the life and ministry of Jesus and is how we participate in His kingdom movement. John says, Jesus said in John's Gospel, like, eat my flesh and drink my blood. In other words, we look to Him and believe. We partake of his grace we turn from sin and live under his rule and reign and we embrace who Jesus is that's what the spiritual life is is more of Jesus and more of Jesus and more of Jesus and more of Jesus like spiritual growth spiritual development 
discipleship is all about more of Jesus, who Jesus is, getting more of Jesus and less of me. And so we are invited in these moments to participate in the Lord's Supper and Eucharist to to see symbolically and physically more of Jesus, that I believe in who He is, that I am partaking in who He is, that I am living under His rule and reign. And that redemptive pattern of Jesus, bless, break, give, becomes my redemptive pattern. It becomes my life rhythm as I seek to live this life of following Jesus, that I offer thanks to God for who He is. I pray that I have eyes to see and ears to hear and see how big He is and remember, right? I have offer my thanks to God for who He is and what He has done. And my response to that, my response to that is I offer myself to God. Paul says we live as living sacrifices to God. That we are offering ourselves to God. We are surrendering ourselves to God. I'm yours. I want you to rule and reign in my life. So I see Him for who He is and thank Him for what He has done. And I respond to that by saying, I'm yours. And my response to that, right? Bless, break, right? I'm broken and give. I give myself out to other people. I serve my spouse. I serve my kids. I serve my coworkers. I serve my classmates. I serve my employees. I serve my employer. I give myself away to my community and to my church because it is bless, break, give. It is the redemptive pattern of the follower of Jesus. And all that comes right into the single moment as we gather around the Lord's table and we celebrate who He is and we offer ourselves afresh through worship of the, the juice and the bread to say His body was broken, His blood was spilled for me. And by partaking of this, I'm doing so so that I might give myself away to others. I'm joining hands with brothers and sisters in the household of faith with These other brothers and sisters who also have broken lives and don't have it all figured out. We gather together to serve each other, encourage each other, love each other in this redemptive pattern of living as a follower of Jesus. And it comes into these moments, right? So it's not just, hey, let's do this once a month or let's get together and have our juice again, right? It's not in these sacred moments. It is a reminder of this redemptive pattern of what following Jesus is all about. So as we gather this morning, let's be reminded of what He has done, of who we are in Him, and that we are a part of God's family. Bless, break, give. God, give us eyes to see, ears to hear. And we're reminded of it in this moment. 